I had a question for Fred, but he's not here yet, so I'll start with one for Tom. Um, uh, Dr. Lovejoy, uh, you've worked in the Amazon for many years. Uh, do you sense a growing concern in Brazil for problems that relate to global warming and conservation of their rainforests? I would say that uh, Brazil has actually played a, an important role in, in global policy about global warming uh, by creating something called the Clean Development Mechanism, which is another form of uh, carbon trading uh, within, uh, within which, for example, uh, a, a country uh, could actually pay for reforestation uh, in another country uh, to offset some carbon that uh, it was uh, releasing to the atmosphere so that the, the net for the atmosphere would be zero. Uh, within, within the nation, though, I don't think the concern about climate change is particularly that large. Uh, certainly there in the press and their, their media are much better about the environment than our media has been for the last three or four years. Uh, as, as a government, they like to separate Amazon forest policy uh, from anything like that. Uh, and they, they don't like to be told what to do with their forests. Uh, However, I think you know the time is is coming when they're going to begin to to look at it the other way around and realize that uh, it can benefit uh, the Brazilian economy and its forests. Now, in terms of their overall management of the Amazon, it it's it's a mixed picture. Uh, there's you know no no end of uh, gloomy things that that we could tell you. Uh, but there is a very positive side to it as well, which doesn't get any coverage, uh, hardly at all, which I, I like to say, you know, when I first went to Brazil in 1965, there was one road in the Amazon, uh, there was one national forest, uh, and today, while everybody knows about the roads and the deforestation and the burning and the blah, 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 uh, what few people realize is that there is now something on the order of 40% of the Brazilian Amazon under some form of protection, whether that's national parks or indigenous areas or, or other units, some even at the state level. Uh, but that's a remarkable achievement. Okay. And if I might add a, uh, an extension of that, um, uh, my group and other groups have been looking at where the fires are in the Amazon. And the indigenous reserves work. Um, fires are not being set in those indigenous reserves. You can almost map out where they are by where the fires aren't. So that's a very substantial uh, achievement in terms of, uh, of, of reducing the, um, the damage. A lot of the Amazon is, is being burned, but the indigenous reserves now are working, and one hopes they will continue to do so. Um, I want to ask another question just to be the devil's advocate here. Um, and um, so I was just, this is for Fred McKenzie. The, uh, Fred, some, uh, many climatologists uh, feel that we're headed for uh, a new ice age sooner or later. Uh, why, should we, why should we be concerned about global warming if, if the world is going to get colder anyway? Oh boy, that's a, that's a good one. Um, theoretically, we should be entering a new ice age in several thousand years. Uh, what I would like to remind everybody is that if we look back through Earth's history, that in actual fact, carbon dioxide levels have been substantially greater. Uh, 450 million years ago, carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere were some 18 to 20 times present levels and the climate was much more equable and much warmer. A hundred million years ago, there was six to eight times the level of carbon dioxide in the present atmosphere, and again, the climate was much warmer. 
The problem lot in the third fact is the Vostok ice core, as you saw it, the carbon dioxide levels for the last 420,000 years and probably for the last 800,000 years have been between 180 and 280 parts per million. And attendant with the high levels has been warm temperatures and attendant with the low levels has been cool temperatures. Now after that long discourse, I believe the problem is mainly a rate problem. The problem is that over all of this geological history I've just spoken about, the rate of rise of carbon dioxide levels is faster than any geological rate that we are aware of right now, caution. And the rate of temperature increase is faster also. So I think the problem is actually a rate problem. Uh, we've had these higher levels in the past of both temperature and carbon dioxide, but the rate of change has been slower. The levels have remained high for tens of millions of years, actually. Uh, this is principally a rate problem. Thank you. I, I don't want to hog the microphone here, but I think there's one more question I'd like to ask for Dr. Feely. And I, I think this is really an essential question. The, uh, the acidification of the ocean is, is so shocking and, and so threatening to us that how can we get this message uh, out to the, to the media in a way that's, that's meaningful and informative to the public? Well, you ask a very tough question. <clears throat> I happen to be uh, driving down to Cal State University with my daughter who was going to graduate school and we were talking about this very issue. And I, she said to me, uh, you have to get this message out. And I said, well, we, we did publish a paper in Science about it. And so, she says, nobody reads science. You have to get the message out. And I, and she, and I said, well, we had a press conference in, in uh, 2004. And I said, but nobody heard your press conference, Dad. You got to get the message out. So I got real frustrated. And I said to her, how do you suggest I get the message out? She says, that's easy. Make a movie. <laughs> and in a sense, I sort of agree with her. We, we, we sort of need to get the message out to very, very large numbers. And we've seen that the way to get to an audience is to get to their medium that they understand and appreciate this. And I think this is where the educational community can work with the um, Hollywood in very positive ways. And I've seen a number of wonderful movies that have been in, of an educational nature that have been very, very popular. Omni uh, comes to mind and some of the great movies that have come together and that the, the uh, general population does indeed um, pay attention to that. And I think through our ed educational programs, particularly at the K-12 level, where we can communicate between the universities and the grade schools in very positive levels, we can reach the community that we really need to address. And I think this is where we should be at. So a new adventure for Nemo. That's right. <laughs> so uh, I, I think now we want to turn this over to the panelists to see if they have any questions for each other. Well, <laughs> barring that, let's, uh, it seems like we have plenty of uh, questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Maybe after this they will. Uh, I, as a majority of one, am not reassured by what I've heard today. I didn't expect to be. I want to ask an abrasive question, and that is this. There are young people who are doing something about what's happening to the planet. They're blowing up SUVs, and they're burning down new housing development. Is there a point? where violence becomes justified, philosophically justified, a serious question, philosophically justified to take against a system, economic and social system, that is destroying the planet. I want to dodge that, but since you brought up SUVs, you've probably all seen that wonderful commercial that said, what would Jesus drive? Um, and I think that's a much better way of tackling SUVs than blowing them up. Because 
um, it, it taps into a, um, an ethical, religious concern about the environment. Um, and while only 10, 11, 12 percent of the Americans care about the environment enough to make it change the way that we vote, 60 or 70 percent of us vote on the basis of our religious beliefs. So, uh, you know, now I'm not really personally in favor of blowing up SUVs apart from when they're in the parking lot that I want to uh, occupy and they've taken up two slots. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think there are much more effective ways of reaching out to, to our fellow citizens to get, to get action. No, I, I'd just like to make a comment on that. I think really it's discussion and education, particular education, that's going to push us forward. If that doesn't work, we do have a problem, but I wouldn't go and blow up an SUV, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Could the panel explain to what extent the, uh, there is a debate about global warming and the The question is, where is the opposition to current government policy in regard to fuel consumption and global warming? What is the basis of controversy? Explain to me, there seems to be a controversy about whether global warming occurs, what the impact of global warming is. There's a controversy surrounding it which has captured the attention of our present administration. Explain to me to the extent you can. What Controversy. Well, I think I can, maybe I can illustrate uh, the controversy. I, I showed early in my talk um, the Wall Street Journal article. And one of the panels in that article, one of the figures in that article, shows the relationship between global mean temperature change over the last century and the length of the solar cycle. The interpretation, there, there is a correlation between the two. The interpretation uh, was that that is the causation. But left out of that interpretation was the fact that changes in sun's luminosity and its uh, amount of solar radiation it delivers to the planetary atmosphere is not a sufficient forcing to call caused the temperature change over the last 150 years. But various individuals, for various reasons, have, for example, taken that correlation, set it as a causation, and that's presented a problem, I think, for the community as a whole, uh, in terms of trying to come to grips with this whole problem of global warming. I think it comes as a problem for the policymakers because they hear one thing and then they hear another thing. But the null hypothesis right now is that global warming is not occurring. And that null hypothesis, okay, has not been supported by most of the evidence to date. Yeah, so another way to say it, uh, it's, not, it's not a, it's more a manufactured controversy than a real one. It's a, it, there's a small number of naysayers uh, and a huge consensus uh, that there is climate change uh, generated by our activities. Uh, but it often gets presented in our media, uh, not elsewhere in the world, as like 50-50, uh, which it isn't at all. And one of the really interesting aspects of, of what uh, Dick Feely told us about is that the acidification of the oceans is a problem whether you believe in climate change or not. It just comes from the concentrations of CO2. Um, so there's, uh, it's, it's just, it's a very curious phenomenon uh, where uh, the general consensus of science in the world, in fact, I mean, really overwhelming consensus, uh, doesn't get reflected properly. You know, I believe that uh, prostitution is supposed to be the oldest profession 
um, and, and scientific prostitution is, um, is certainly venerable and is going to be around for a long time. Um, the question, in a sense, of course, is what you do about it. Um, I'm always impressed and tell my students to go and watch a movie called Shattered Glass about a reporter called Stephen Glass who managed to fabricate 40 or 50 articles um, and finally got caught when he invented a software company which he claimed to be the third largest software company in the country uh, and of course it didn't exist and finally, finally somebody you know, typed the name of the software company into a search engine and found that it didn't exist. The issue with, with uh, biostitution, and, and, and many of us live in a world where the biostitutes are out there, um, is that people don't check facts. Um, even the most trivial, obvious, simple facts. Um, and I think we have to, as we move into a more complex and probably more dangerous world, somehow we have to encourage people um, to, to check the simple facts and look at what's underlying these complicated issues. Some of them are complicated, some of them are mind-bogglingly simple. People out there who are telling, telling the world that there are more forests now than there were 50 years ago, and all you have to do to, is to go to Google Earth and see the pictures of the destruction of the Amazon forest. So, uh, this, Stuart's point is a, is a really very important one, and it, it relates in part to the very different media world we have today. Uh, because when we lived uh, at a time when there were just three networks in public television, uh, they basically vied with each other to be the first to get the story. Uh, and the consequence of that uh, was that everybody in the country had pretty much the same information base. And today it is so easy to go to you know, one of 200 channels and find out what you like to hear uh, and think that's the truth, uh, that we really have to work to overcome that. OK. Uh, this, uh, you, sir, in the back. There, there are two panelists that mentioned the importance of these natural corridors or greenways you know, to make it easier for species to go from one area to another. Uh, the Union Pacific right here in Chicago has a railroad right away that they're abandoning. They want, I think it's close to a million and a half dollars per mile for this. Is that wide enough to do what you're suggesting? Has there been any studies of minimum widths for these corridors? David, that's yours. Okay, well that's, <laughs> uh, I would say that, that that would be more than enough to connect uh, prairies because uh, prairies can exist in relatively small areas that, uh, for example, we have a, a reconstructed prairie at the garden and it consists of 20 acres and uh, it includes most of the species of the tall grass prairie. So I would say uh, a corridor of that size for a prairie would be fine. Um, for a uh, tropical rainforest, perhaps not, but certainly for a prairie, it would be very helpful. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, in a sense, you're all speaking to the choir. Have you ever thought about going to Congress and telling them what you're telling us? <laughs> I mean, not to be funny, but I think that's the truth. If you would go to Congress and you show them the data and you explain to them, because it's obvious they're not paying attention now, and plus they're talking now about drilling into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge again, which the Senate voted against a few years ago, but now they're leaning towards, um, I think that's where you guys should go. Well, the answer is that, that some of us do that, uh, and there are some very attentive people on the Hill, uh, but they seem to be in a minority these, these days. Um, I was going to sort of comment that, no, I haven't been to Congress you know, this week. Um, I, I think many of us realize that we have to devote an increasing amount of time talking to our elected public officials. Um, and I'm a lot more optimistic about, about what you can accomplish by that. Uh, in the, for many years, I lived in East Tennessee, where the congressman had um, a, a League of Conservation voter score of exactly zero. Um, and, and I went to see him, and he told me how environmental legislation harmed the good people of East Tennessee. Uh, with a coffee table 
covered in books about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is in his district. And I pointed out that that national park is probably worth a, you know, $100 million a year, maybe more, maybe $500 million a year to his constituents. Um, I think the important thing is that many of us give up, many people give up the, the right to, to talk to our elected officials. And consequently, we leave that to the lobbyists. Um, my experiences you know, have always been very good, even with politicians who are not particularly environmentally friendly. I think the important thing is that they hear the message. And if we let, leave that message to lobbyists, we get what we deserve. Um, and I we, think what Stuart is also saying, we all need to do it, not just scientists who happen to have a deep understanding of a particular topic. Michael? There are very powerful economic interests out there that don't want to hear what you're saying. And there are media that are run by, owned by the same economic interests that really don't want to support that. It's not at the level of the journalist, but it's the one who actually owns the media. We can sit here and talk rationally about the reasons why global warming is, is occurring, what the consequences are. But the ones who really have the economic power to put these uh, policies into place aren't interested in doing that. They're perfectly willing to see a great deal of destruction occur because they have other interests. Given that, you know, we can just sit here and keep spinning our wheels and until we recognize this blockage at the top, nothing is going to occur. Because as the chairman over here observed, it really isn't all that controversial. I mean, you know, the science is out there, it's convincing we know what to, to do, given the fact that on top of all that, there are these powerful interests that aren't willing to do anything. How do you address that? Well, let, let me uh, start, and I'm sure everybody here has some thoughts. Uh, the question is, is how do we deal with something which uh, is against very large vested interests? Uh, and uh, the good news here is that there is a whole realm of activity, very positive activity going on both at the state level in this country uh, and uh, in a number of very major corporations. Uh, so the New England states uh, and California basically have uh, set up some legislation about limiting greenhouse gases. And that ultimately is going to in drive industry bananas because they don't want to produce one kind of thing for use in California and New England and a different version of the same thing for the rest of the, of the nation. Um, and they're also, and those that are international, uh, are having those standards put on them elsewhere in the world. So at a certain point, they're going to ask Washington to please set up something that's a uniform playing field. Uh, and the major corporations, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's a lot of enlightened leadership. And I mean, I never would have believed that in, on the 1st of September, or indeed at any time, I would be addressing the strategic leadership conference of the Caterpillar Corporation about sustainability and what they should be doing about greenhouse gases. Well, in fact, they're already ahead on some things. Um, they've already figured out ways to use the generators they make to burn the methane from landfills. Uh, methane is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Uh, and while, you know, if you, you burn it, you'll produce CO2, it's a lot better than just having that methane go into the air. So, uh, you know, a number of these really big mega corporations in the world, there is this kind of thinking. And at a certain moment, I think you're just going to have the dam break and we'll move forward. Okay. 
Uh, you, sir. Kind of relates to all the previous questions that have been asked here, but a lot of the talks today were focused upon sustaining corridors as well as the increased greenhouse gas emissions. But in sustaining the corridors, you're going to see a very big latitudinal shift of environments anyway as greenhouse gases continue to get emitted. And as somebody associated with one of the science departments here at Northwestern, I'm fully aware of the lack of resources available to a lot of our research. So where should the primary focus right now be? Should it be in establishing these corridors, which if the latitudinal gradients continue to shift will get changed anyway? or focusing upon education and focusing upon reducing the greenhouse gas emissions themselves before we can focus upon reestablishing biodiversity and focusing on that. Well, let me give my own answer and then share it with the others. Uh, it's not a real choice. You gotta do both. You absolutely have to do both. Uh, and I, that's what I was trying to say at, at the end of my talk is there is no single solution here. There's no sort of uh, easy choice, there are a whole bunch of things we have to do at the same time. And one of those is heightening public awareness of what's going on and what's so why it's so important to uh, do something about it. And the other is to actually make our conservation systems resilient in the face of climate change. Um, because yes, the zones will change and the species will move, uh, but they're not going to move if there are obstacle courses. Uh, yes, ma'am. Are there particular bills that you would uh, suggest that we support? Do you have numbers, whatever I call my senators or people, they want to know the number of the bill that I'm asking about? Well, there's one you don't even have to give a number for. It's just the McCain-Lieberman bill on, on uh, caps and carbon trading. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not sure I interpreted all the data that was presented here today, but I get the sense, uh, the ironic sense, that up until this century, or the 19th century, there was the utopian view of what's going to happen in the future. It seems to me today this is just a dystopian view of what's going to happen in the future. And I'm wondering, sorting out, trying to sort through all of this, is there any, is there any hope for us? Um, Yes, um, I came to, from a meeting yesterday in, in, in New York, and, and it was to celebrate um, the issue of Scientific American um, that was published last month um, about, about global challenges. So it had the likes of uh, Jeffrey Sachs saying that we can, uh, we can eliminate poverty, um, Avery Levin saying that um, we're all going to make a huge amount of money by becoming efficient and defeating global warming that way. Um, I was saying that we can be very optimistic about saving biodiversity. It's a incredibly optimistic view of the future. And even if only a third of it is right, we will have a fantastic future. So, so yeah, this has been a bit of a sort of a depressing meeting. But there are a lot of people out there who hold a very, very marvelous, warm, fuzzy feeling that we will get through this bottleneck quickly uh, and we will enter, enter the world of Jean-Luc Picard and Star Trek. Um, and they, it, it, they don't have to, it doesn't have to be entirely right, but there's extra, like, like Tom was saying, there's extraordinarily good news when you find that many big companies, Fortune 100 companies, have reduced their global em uh, carbon emissions by much more than Kyoto would have required them to do. And I guess maybe I'm a little more pessimistic than my colleagues here, and that might be because I've been thinking about this issue and writing about it now for almost 45 years. And I don't think until something really dramatic happens, that as a world community, we're going to re react in a strongly positive sense to the whole problem of global warming. And by that I mean something like the uh, Thermal hailing circulation of the ocean slows down or, or uh, maybe even in the longer run ceases. And instead of Stuart Pym's warming Britain, it will be Stuart's Pym colder Britain. And until something like that happens, I, I just haven't seen people as a global community re very reactive to this. Yes, the Europeans to some extent in the United States and Canada, but don't forget that um, most of the world's population lies in the developing world. 
And as far as I am aware, and I could stand corrected on this, I don't see China and India, two of the biggest developing nations for the future, mm -hmm. reacting very strongly to this whole problem of global warming. Well, let me put it another way. Uh, you know, 25 years ago was the first time the word biological diversity was, was used, 1980. And the whole issue of, of, of climate change uh, was on very few agendas. And yet, in 1992, at the Earth Summit in Rio, uh, still the largest gathering of national leaders in the history of, of everything, uh, there were two international conventions addressing those two problems. Now, are they being implemented as, as rapidly or as strongly as they should? No. But that you could actually get that kind of recognition in the international community says that the potential for major movement in the right direction and for looking at these challenges as opportunities uh, and opportunities for human creativity to come up with solutions that we can't even imagine uh, today, uh, I think is very real. I, I think there's another hopeful sign. I, I was talking with the uh, lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy the other night, and he was telling me that the Chinese government has asked the Nature Conservancy to put together a conservation plan for the whole country. Now, this, China is a country that's characteristically not been very concerned about the environment. So uh, I was very delighted to, to hear that they were interested in doing that. It sounds like something that's, that's very sincere and something that's badly needed. So there, there are hopeful signs on the horizon. It's, it's important not to be too pessimistic. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, did we have one over here? Pardon me, comment, pardon me, question. Personally, I'm very concerned about earth warming because it sounds silly, but I remember the barrel of polar bear book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, you know, that's a really a good point because if um, in the 1960s you would have been hearing about global freezing, and in actual fact, my wife, who elementary school teacher at that time, had a textbook in which the whole book at the end, in terms of meteorology and climate change, was actually uh, devoted to the uh, colder weather, to the, to the freeze to come, not to the warming. Okay. I think we need to uh, conclude now. Thank you all for coming today. It's been a pleasure having you here. Today.